Hello, this is Miss Kilburn Bond from Malmesbury School. I'm going to talk to you about the poem Storm on the Island by Seamus Heaney. And the purpose for doing this video is to try and help you understand, first of all, just what the poem's about, the key events and the key theme in the poem Storm on the Island. That's assessment objective one. And then you'll know by now that to be really successful in your GCSE exam, you also need to be able to analyse the effect of the poet's choice of language, form and structure. So how the poem is organised, how language is used for assessment objective two. And then finally, to explore how the context, so the history behind the poem, what we know about the poet, how that might suggest alternative interpretations of the poem, how we might perhaps read this poem once, and then when we learn a little bit more about Seamus Heaney, then maybe it will make us see something a little bit different, and that hopefully will all become clear by the end of the video. Before we move on, can you just please check now that you have got a copy of the poem in front of you, so your anthology, a pencil, highlighter, something, so you can make notes, because rather than me writing and filming myself annotating the poem, I think it's much better that you listen and make your own annotations because that forces you to do that in your own words and that will mean much more to you when you come to revise. So before we get into the poem, I'm actually going to um, play you a bit of a sound clip now because sound in this poem is incredibly important and features all the way through it. So I just want you to have a little listen to this sound clip and try and pick out what it is you can hear is happening and that will help us when we get to talk about the poem in a minute. Played a little bit of a trick on you there because the picture, the image that you could see before was of huge storm clouds which obviously relates to the poem Storm on the Island and some of the sounds that you were listening to were actually the sound of a storm at sea so you would have heard sounds that are going to be reflected in the subject of the poem but mixed up with that sound you also would have heard the sound of an air bombardment so of aeroplanes bombing a place beneath them and that was very deliberately done because in this poem one of the things that Heaney does is that he uses a lot of language that's to do with the military that's to do with a bombardment so aeroplanes dropping shells bombs on the land below them to describe what this storm is like when it hits the island and on the screen in front of you you can see some vocabulary that you might not have come across before that's linked to those military images so we've got strafe an attack to attack repeatedly with bombs or machine gun fire from low-flying aircraft. We've got salvo, a simultaneous discharge of artillery or other guns in a battle. And then a very similar meaning, a word you probably have heard before, a bombardment or to bombard, a continuous attack with bombs, shells or other missiles. So if you pause the video and find those words in the poem, if you didn't know before what they meant, then you might just want to make a little note of that now, because that will obviously help you as we go on to understand the poem. So Storm on the Island by Seamus Heaney. We're about to read a monologue. So a monologue is a poem that comes across like it's a speech, like it's a single character who's talking their thoughts aloud to us. And there are other poems in the anthology that use a similar technique. You'll notice in the bottom screen, the bottom left hand corner, there's that little book saying literary terms. So as we go through the poem, if I think I'm using any terminology that you might not be familiar with, and you might want to challenge yourself to learn some of this literary terminology, then I've explained it using that little book with the definition next to it. And obviously there's plenty available online or in revision books to help you understand any of those terms more. Just a reminder though, the exam is not an opportunity to show off how many terms you've learned. It's much more important that you show an understanding of the poem. If you know any of the terminology, then that can help, but it's certainly not the most important thing. So we're going to start with listening to a reading 
of the poem. This isn't the voice of Seamus Heaney, but it is the voice of an Irish actor and Seamus Heaney as a poet from Northern Ireland would have sounded very similar. So if we just listen to this and then once the reading is over, I'd like you to pause the video and then read the poem yourself at least twice because that's really gonna help the words sink in and you'll start to understand it a lot more. Whereas if we rush straight into me talking about it, you're less likely to feel like you're keeping up. So listen to it once and then read it a couple of times for yourself. We are prepared. We build our houses squat, sink walls in rock and roof them with good slate. This wizened earth has never troubled us. With hay, so as you see, there are no stacks or stooks that can be lost. Nor are there trees which might prove company when it blows full blast. You know what I mean. Leaves and branches can raise a tragic chorus in a gale so that you listen to the thing you fear, forgetting that it pummels your house too. But there are no trees, no natural shelter. You might think that the sea is company, exploding comfortably down on the cliffs. But no, when it begins, the flung spray hits the very windows, spits like a tame cat turned savage. We just sit tight, while wind dives and strafes invisibly. Space is a salvo. We are bombarded by the empty air. Strange. It is a huge nothing that we fear. I've broken the poem down into three parts just to sort of talk through. You'll notice that the poem isn't broken into stanzas. It's actually one long, I think it's 19 line stanza. And some literary um, critics have looked at this poem and thought that there's meaning in the fact that the poem isn't broken down into stanzas because what you see is the text sort of huddled together in the middle of your page with lots of white space around it. And as you understand the poem and the idea that this storm is coming to threaten the people on the island who all have to kind of huddle down and try and stay safe together, by the end of the poem, um, Heaney's talking about fearing this invisible thing that's surrounding them, then maybe the shape of the poem helps to um, reflect that idea. It's a poem that's written in blank verse, so that means even though it has got a sort of rhythm that's established through the metric of the poem, so the way that syllables work, it doesn't rhyme and it reflects the way that we speak, which again reinforces this idea that the poem is a monologue. So if we look at the very beginning, we are prepared are our first three words before we get to that colon. And it's a very confident start, so we've got this first person plural pronoun here, we, and immediately this speaker who's talking to us sounds like he's representing a group, a spokesperson if you like, who's talking about everybody who lives on the island presumably and saying that collectively this is what they have done as islanders. We are prepared. There's a very confident start in that this poet, this spokesperson, sorry, this narrator sounds really confident that they are ready for this storm. By the end of the poem that confidence will have been destroyed and that's something that's important to the structure of the poem. So we are prepared, an immediately confident start, but it also gives us a sense that there's an ongoing conflict between humans and nature in this poem and these islanders have had to learn how to survive against it. So we are prepared, we know what might come and we've done things to prepare for that. We build our houses squat, sink walls in rock and roof them with good slate. So I'd just like to talk to you about the word consonants here. So it's a bit like alliteration. So you can see you've got alliteration there in rock and roof um, with squat and slate and sink. So I'm sure alliteration is something you've heard a lot about before. Now anything like this, any pattern like alliteration helps build the sound of the poem. And what's happening in this beginning of this poem is that Heaney's trying to create a sound that reinforces this very confident tone that the speaker's got, the idea that these islanders have done everything they can to be solid and the sound of the poem's quite solid too. Now the consonants is this 
similarly to alliteration is this technique where you repeat similar sounding consonants not necessarily at the beginning of words. So for example we've got the rock and the sink both ending with the K and we've got the build and the good both ending with the D. We've got the prepared which also ends with the D and then of course prepared in itself has got the double P. So we've got quite a few sounds in this poem that set up this idea that this is a really confident tone at the start. It's a celebration of human resourcefulness that humans have done everything they can to survive to prepare for what nature might be about to throw at them. This wizened earth has never troubled us with hay, so as you can see, there are no stacks or stooks that can be lost. Now you could say this is a little bit ironic here because most people would think that to be able to grow crops and have stacks and stooks of hay would be a good thing, but what Heaney is saying that this island is so sort of desolate that it cannot even support growing this kind of crop. So we've got the stooks, which is a group of sheaves that stand up to dry in a field, and then the stacks meaning haystacks. So we've got a really rural setting here for this poem and Heaney wrote about rural settings, farmland, nature an awful lot, particularly in the collection that this poet poem comes from. I'd also like to point out the direct address here. So as you see, now as soon as Heaney introduces that word you, he's talking to us, the reader, he's involving us in this situation and it's still part of this conversational feel but it also brings the reader in to be waiting alongside the islanders to see what's going to happen next and as the poem gets a little bit more frightening then we as the reader have already been pulled into that rising tension. Okay, let's move on. Nor are there trees which might prove company when it blows full blast. You know what I mean. So lots of the things at this part of the poem, Heaney's actually telling us what isn't there on the island rather than what is. So there are no trees on this island. So because the island's presumably battered by the wind so often, trees don't really thrive there. So what Heaney then says about the trees is they might prove company when it blows full blast. You know what I mean. Leaves and branches can raise a tragic chorus in a gale so that you listen to the thing you fear, forgetting that it pummels your house too. So at this point in the poem, it's almost like he's imagining that if the island did have trees on it, then when this storm hits, the trees might actually provide some company. It would be less lonely, less isolating, because what would happen is as that wind was blowing full blast, then it would become like a noise he compares to raising a tragic chorus in a gale. Now, what he's referring to when he talks about a tragic chorus is a link back to like singing. We hear the idea of a chorus, but in a Greek tragedy, so going back through literature a very long time, a Greek chorus that would their job in a play was to explain the events of the play, to kind of make it clear to the audience what was about to happen and what it would mean. So it's a quite an interesting image because this sort of metaphorical personification of what the trees would be able to do is if there were trees on the island maybe they would help make sense of things maybe they would help the islanders understand what was happening because he's saying that if the trees were there you could listen to that and it almost forget that actually that wind is going to pummel your house too. Now pummeling a very violent word there pummeling meaning kind of repeatedly punching so it's also personification and what we can now start to feel is this increasing tension as Heaney's describing the gathering energy of the storm and linked to that we've got some a great example of enjambement here as well where there the line breaks don't show the end of an idea or the end of a sentence so the ideas run on over each line and that can be seen to be the idea of this kind of gathering storm if you think about storm clouds gathering and getting denser and how the atmosphere changes you could talk about how the structure of the poem reflects that through these lines running on into each other so, but there are no trees, no natural shelter. So we've talked about this lots of negative language here about what there isn't. 
you might think that the sea is company exploding comfortably down on the cliffs but no when it begins the flung spray hits the very windows spits like a tame cat turned savage now you could talk about this being a little bit of a shift now in the direction of the poem and what's actually happening. So we've got this emphasising the negative, the lack of no natural shelters, a bit more of alliteration there isn't there? We've got also repetition, no trees, no natural shelter. So everything's about emphasising what there isn't on this island. We've got the direct address again, so constantly bringing us to, as the reader into this scenario. You might think that the sea is company. So he needs kind of double guessing what we might think would make make this situation easier to cope with. And then Heaney basically explains how no, that's not the case. So we might think that the sound of the sea would also be company. Now, hopefully you've noticed that that word company has already come up before. So it came up when he was talking about the wind blowing full blast earlier in the poem, which might prove company when it blows full blast. Now he's saying that the sea might be company. And it's not an accident that he's used the word company twice. That repetition is emphasising the loneliness of this setting that there is no company, that nature hasn't provided anything to support these humans on this island, that they are absolutely isolated and vulnerable against the storm that's coming their way. <clears throat> so you might think that the Sears company exploding comfortably down on the cliffs, but no. So those two monosyllabic, just one syllable words, but no, definitely blows that idea out of the water, if you like, and makes it clear to us as a reader that when this storm starts, there is absolutely no release and no comfort. Exploding comfortably is an example of an oxymoron. So exploding and comfortably are two words that seem quite strangely put together. An explosion, if I'd ask you to write down all the words you think of when you hear that word explosion, I don't think anyone would have written down comfortable. They usually would be seen as quite opposite things. What on earth could be comfortable about an explosion? So it's a very deliberately used image here that shows how nature is very comfortable. The sea exploding comfortably down on the cliffs, this storm exploding comfortably is in its element, whereas for us as humans, it doesn't seem like a particularly comfortable experience at all. So when it begins, and this is a storm, the flung spray hits the very windows. So now the storm has arrived and is actually sort of attacking, if you like, where people are living, their home, which usually feels like a safe kind of precious place to be, but now the storm is spitting on those windows like a tame cat turned savage. So we've got some sibilants there with the spit and the savage, and if you listen to sort of spit savage, you can hear a very clever use of sibilants to represent that kind of spitting sound of the water on the windows. But we've also got this really interesting simile. So comparing the water hitting the windows to spitting like a tame cat is taking something very familiar, a cat, somebody's pet, something that people see as pretty harmless, but spitting like a tame cat turned savage, a cat that was once safe and suddenly has become something that's that's a threat, that's dangerous, that's angry, just like nature, a beautiful calm thing, suddenly this storm has turned on us as humans and that's one of the important ideas in the poem. And we've got more in Jean Beaumont here as well, this building momentum of the storm, there's no security, there's no safe structure in this poem, the storm and the way the poem works are reflecting this idea that nothing is predictable, that things are happening and happening in a frightening way. So we get to the end of the poem now. We just sit tight. So remember we, we talked about at the beginning of the poem, the idea that we're collectively with the islanders in this experience. We just sit tight while wind dives and strafes invisibly. Now you remember at the beginning I gave you some of this vocabulary linking it to the military and we've got this attack 
mocking idea that the wind is a, like it's attacking with bullets, but it's doing so invisibly. And that's one of the things about the storm that Heaney at the end of the poem is reflecting on make it so terrifying that you cannot see this thing that is so dangerous, it's invisible. Space is a salvo. So again, salvo, that firing of several guns and weapons. And we've got that sibilance there. Space is a salvo. We are bombarded with the empty air. So what Heaney's doing here is reminding us and making it really clear that this storm is as threatening and violent as being under attack from bombs and shells and bullets. But there's nothing to see. The storm is empty, it's invisible. And that's what makes it so terrifying, what makes it so fascinating and amazing, if you like. So at the end of the poem, nature is being shown as being hugely powerful and hugely intimidating and invisible, which adds to that reason why we fear it. And the word fear we've seen earlier in the poem, and the poem is now going to end with that word fear, because this is a poem that builds to this sense that there is something terrifying about our relationship with nature. We are bombarded with the empty air. Strange. It is a huge nothing that we fear. That word strange gives a very puzzling philosophical tone to the end of the poem. Like the narrator's kind of thinking out loud, isn't this strange? Isn't it weird? Isn't it unusual? That the thing that's made us so terrified and is a, such a risk to us is nothing. It's invisible. We can't see it. We can't touch it. It actually only really kind of does anything that we can see or feel when it come when the storm comes up against something material and then we know it's there when it's hitting the window we know it's there when the waves are hitting the cliff we know it's there but really it's something that's invisible and that ultimate power of nature really fascinating and if we look at the mood now at the end of the poem it is so different. It contrasts entirely with the mood that we had at the beginning. At the beginning, we are prepared. We build our houses, squat, sink walls in rock. All the things and all those sounds in the poem that were about we as humans are resourceful and these are the things that we have done to survive. By the end of the poem, all that confidence has gone and instead we have this puzzled and frightened tone where the storm seems like something that's so powerful it's almost hard to define and is compared to a military bombardment. And that's a good point then to have a look at the poet Seamus Heaney. So Seamus Heaney, really hugely well respected poet, won the Nobel Prize for Literature um, and is known for being a poet who writes a lot about the natural world, his environment. So he grew up in Northern Ireland in the county of Derry and he writes a lot about that environment, particularly um, rural landscapes and farming and characters that he remembers from that time. And this poem exists in an anthology that is mostly about nature and relationships with nature. So it absolutely makes sense in some ways to stop the video here and say that's what the poem's about. It's about a storm that comes and threatens the people on this island and shows that nature's always going to have the power. But I think it'd be wrong to end the video there because a lot of people have looked at this poem and started to see a possible second meaning to the poem. Now we don't know for certain what Heaney was thinking when he wrote the poem and some people find that kind of thing frustrating about poetry but it's one of the things that I love about it that we can think and speculate and sometimes not really ever find out exactly what was going on in the poet's mind and this poem lends itself to this idea that there are alternative interpretations, that there are different ways of looking at it. And in your exam, it's absolutely okay to explore an alternative interpretation. You don't have to know things for sure. It's okay to say, it is possible that this could mean. Some people might think or interpret this quote as meaning. I'm going to um, try and help you understand this alternative meaning by showing you this picture here, which is of um, a building called Stormont, which is where the Northern Irish Parliament, the government building, is what is called Stormont. 
Now, if you look at the title, Storm on the Island, and I've put different colours on this to try and help you see this, a lot of people reading this poem have started to notice that if you look at the first two words and then the first letter of the third word, it actually spells out Stormont. And then if you look at Ireland, the last word, well, Ireland and Ireland, the country, are homophones of each other. Storm on the Stormont. So we've got the government building for Northern Ireland. And then we've got Ireland against Ireland. So we've got the country as opposed to an island surrounded by sea. And if we use this, we can then start to see something a little bit different in this poem. So maybe it's not just about some people living on an island being terrified of a storm that comes and attacks them, if you like. Maybe it's about something that was happening in Heaney's lifetime as he was writing this poem. So I've already mentioned that he grew up in County Derry in Northern Ireland and I'm sure a lot of you are already thinking that anyone who was growing up in the time that he was alive, so he wrote this poem in the 1960s in Northern Ireland, would have been absolutely aware of the political tensions at the time because the history of Ireland is very chequered by conflict. For hundreds of years there's been conflict in Ireland. Now Northern Ireland is part of the United Kingdom and as the 60s was developing there was increasing tension between two groups of people if you like who lived in Northern Ireland. The Unionists, so mostly Protestants, who wanted Northern Ireland to remain part of the United Kingdom and then the Nationalists who were mostly Catholic and they were a smaller group of people but a powerful group of people who wanted Northern Ireland to become part of the Republic of Ireland. And tensions, it's very complicated and you don't need to know all the complexities at all for the exam. What you need to understand is that as Heaney was writing this poem there was a lot of tension building between these two groups of people. And actually, just a couple of years after he wrote the poem, things came to a head, which resulted in the British Army being stationed in Northern Ireland, and then the start of the Troubles, which went on for 30 years. You might have heard of the Troubles, um, perhaps most infamous for the actions of the IRA and the terrorist attacks that went alongside that group. So Heaney, whilst he didn't know exactly what was going to happen with the Troubles afterwards, he certainly was living in a society where he was surrounded by tension. And if we relate this to the poem, to this idea of people waiting and knowing that something is coming and knowing that it could be violent and knowing that it's difficult and frightening, then the poem takes on a very different feeling and if we think about the military images then perhaps that helps us to understand this idea more. So I'm just going to let you listen to um, a short clip just explaining very briefly a little bit about the environment at the time. A meeting between O'Neill and the Prime Minister of the Republic of Ireland, Sean Lemass, seemed for extreme unionists to confirm the dire political consequences of softness towards Roman Catholicism. Le Mas had been in the old IRA, and this was the first meeting between Prime Ministers of the two Irish states for 40 years. How politically dangerous was it for O'Neill to try and change the climate of unionist thinking after 40 years? Well, it's always impossible to tell, isn't it, uh, before any action, uh, what danger you're running. We discussed this, actually, during our meeting, which of us would get into the most trouble. I said I would, and he said he would. He did get into a certain amount of trouble during the first six weeks, but nothing to the trouble that I got into uh, later on. O'Neill's attempt to soften the bigoted face of Ulster Unionism met an onslaught from the Reverend Ian Paisley, who saw any gesture of friendship towards the Catholic community in Ireland as a potential threat to the security of the state. Captain O'Neill recently said that the south of Ireland was a very beautiful young lady and that he was very glad to talk to her over the head. Of course, Captain O'Neill's a married man and he shouldn't be talking over the hedge to any young ladies. But I want to say this evening that we don't look 
upon the south of Ireland as a beautiful young lady. We look upon the south of Ireland as the refuge for the murderers of policemen and law enforcement officers and Protestants who will not bow the knee to the Romish bill. A third of the population of the North looked on the south of Ireland as their motherland. And when in the mid-1960s a grouping of old nationalist leaders and new young radically minded people formed a civil rights association to end discrimination in jobs and housing, this movement began to take on a nationalist, though non-violent, tinge. A civil rights march was planned for Derry on October the 5th, 1968, but banned by storm. Any person who wishes to parade or hold a meeting is quite at liberty to do so provided he holds it other than in an area specified in the order led by the minister. We are the people of Derry and we intend marching in our city. We welcome you, sir. the Royal Ulster Constabulary went into action. After this, Northern Ireland would never be the same again. So before we end looking at the poem in detail, we look at these two images now side by side. We've got the gathering storm clouds over the sea. The first most obvious reading of this poem about nature, about nature's power over humans, about this constant conflict, if you like, between humans and their relationship with nature. How by the end of this poem, nature has proved itself to be more powerful and intimidating. And then we've got the picture of the rising tension in Northern Ireland and this political reading of the poem that perhaps it's a poem that's also about rising tension and feeling like something is going to happen politically and there's nothing that we can do about it, that it's quite frightening that there's this kind of building feeling and yet not really knowing when it's going to explode if you like and how that's going to play out. It's about human capacity for violence which of course then played out through the Troubles. Whichever reading we look at this idea that the poem ends with a philosophical tone thinking about how often what we're frightened of is something that we can't quite define remains an interesting one and conflict whether we see the poem as being about a storm in weather and nature, or whether we see it about political conflict, it's about humans and their relationship and their power or powerlessness in both of those situations. So I really hope that helps you feel that you understand the poem a little bit more. Before I end, I just want to talk to you about making comparative links because in the exam you cannot just talk about the poem on its own in isolation, you have to be able to link it with another poem from the collection. Now you could find links with every poem in the collection but I've just tried to pull out the ones that I think perhaps are most obvious to give you a bit of a helping hand to start you off. So we could look at Ozymandias Shelley. So both poets explore the destructive power of nature over human achievements and pride. I think there's a lot that you could say with those two poems. They work really nicely together. We've got Prelude, so the Wordsworth poem. In both poems the narrator's exploring this sort of moment in their life where they learn and accept humans and their fragile place in a much bigger, more powerful natural world. So again, lots of interesting comparisons there. 
Now in My Last Duchess by Browning, we've got two dramatic monologues, very different in tone, but what both do is as the poem progresses, it becomes perhaps more obvious what that tone is meant to be. So the mocking tone of Browning, which is then attacking the way that society treat women and how the way that humans treat, trying to control and abuse the power they've got. And then we've got this idea in Storm of the Island that the confidence at the beginning and then having to accept that actually some things are more powerful than you will ever be. Could be quite an interesting comparison, I think. We've got Exposure by Owen. In both poems, again, we've got this relationship between humans and nature. Both potentially have got a political message too about being powerless. We've got the soldiers in Owen who are powerless to the weather, but also this idea that like, nothing changes, that they're exposed, they don't have any control over what's happening, they're just following orders. Then in Bayonet Charge, Hughes, we've got that moment of the soldier doing the bayonet charge where fear means that he kind of drops pride and power and everything that he'd been taught to believe in in that moment. Just like in this poem, Storm on the Island, we've got the absolute sort of terrifying fear of something you can't see. So there's an interesting comparison there. Remains by Armitage, we've got the two poems using a conversational tone. They're both exploring psychology in a way, the feeling of being powerless to fear, to trauma. And then finally, in the poem Tissue by Darker, you've got both poems exploring this idea that humans are fragile. And if we use the political analogy about the troubles and storm on the island, you could also then talk about both poems using extended metaphor as a technique. So hopefully at this point you're able to talk or write about the key events and the key theme in the poem. You should be able to pick out some of those techniques that we've talked about in terms of the language but also the form and structure of the poem and think about how that impacts on meaning. There's no point in talking about those things unless you can relate it to how it changes the meaning. And then finally the context. So we've looked at how when we look at the context of this poem it actually gives us two different interpretations that are interesting to explore. Thank you for listening.